welcome to another episode here on the Amber Gardener channel. Today we're going to be harvesting some stuff, and I know it's another harvesting video, but it's a first for some of the stuff here. It's going to be a first for peppers, and it's also going to be a first for tomatoes, and a first for some cucumbers. We've already, harvest, uh, we've already harvested a ton of cucumbers, so um, that's nothing new for me, but it'll be new for you. And also, it will be a first for peppers for me. Um, I know, it's a... Uh, pretty embarrassing, but it's cool that we have peppers this year. We normally have the dinkiest, smallest peppers. I don't know what it is with our soil, but it grows peppers horribly. But this year, we put in uh, just a whole ton of compost, 30 cubic yards over this entire garden. Um, we tilled it extra deep with uh, a huge, huge rototiller. We rented one because the ones we used were never going to get the job done. So we got in really deep, tilled down about a foot deep, then put the compost on top of that, and then we also used um, some trifecta on the pepper plants here, and they're really liking it. I mean, they're really, really liking this. And uh, basically, we got some peppers here, and uh, I'm pretty excited. We have uh, some smaller ones that will be ready a little bit later. They're coming on for a second harvest. Um, and then we also have uh, the big ones that are ready. Now, normally, these would change colors. They're a, a colored California Wonder Bell, um, by far my favorite uh, type of bell pepper. They're so large, so juicy, crisp, almost like an apple, and um, and they just come in such beautiful colors. But the thing is, is with such a wet season, anyone knowing uh, knowing what position I'm in would harvest them at the same time as well. Because as gardeners, we love to get colors uh, in our garden. Everything is really colorful and really beautiful. But sometimes things can't always happen that way because it's been so wet here that the bugs are noticing the plants a little more frequently. We're starting to, it's definitely starting to wind down. Um, the signs of the end of the season are upon us. Uh, tomatoes are in the same shape. Um, I'm embarrassed to say it, but they are in very poor shape. Uh, and it's just the way the season's been. It has been so wet and so cold and it's been relentless. I could probably count on I could probably count on one day, or on one hand, how many days we've had over uh, 90 degrees, which is really what it takes to get nice colorful peppers. It also takes uh, that to get nice sized potatoes. We did get some nice nice potatoes, but um, the rain just really took a number on them. The rain and the cold just let the bugs come right on in. And then the blight on the tomatoes, you know, you need 90 degree temperatures to ripen up tomatoes, and we've probably had maybe a bushel total out of all 300 plants that we have. So not that good. Um, but hey, like I said, you win some, you lose some. So let's focus on the good because, you know, so often we can focus on the good, um, but it gets overshadowed by the bad. And sometimes if we just look at a couple good things, it can really set your day uh, in the right direction. And um, sure, the, might, the bad things will still happen. The bad things will still be there, but it just kind of draws your attention off of it so that you can focus on the things that you can control. You know, look how beautiful these are. I mean, check this out right here you know this is I'm gonna I'm gonna pick this one right here but look at this I mean not the biggest pepper in the world but definitely larger than we've ever had um, and there's a lot bigger ones in here too like this one. Oh, oh yeah look at that very decent sized bell pepper and uh, you know hey we got, we got about uh, I think we have 40 plants here uh, 36 or 40 something like that and um, and that's the story with all these. So I'm liking what I'm seeing. So let's harvest some of these. You know, we really do have some beautiful plants in here. I am, I'm so pleased. You know, each one of these plants uh, kind of just grew up and made this beautiful hedge here and uh, really happened exactly like how I anticipated. And you can see here, we have the basil that we've used as kind of a beneficial intercropping. The uh, basically aphids don't like the smell of basil. So as I'm picking, you know, I'm bumping up against this stuff and uh, <laughs> I'm telling you what, look at all the peppers down here. Look at that. You just got so many peppers. You got beautiful sized pepper. And uh, this is going to be difficult to do one handed, but 
another pepper. I'm kind of sticking them in between my legs as I go so I can pick another one. Look at that one, there we go. Another beautiful one. I mean, tell me, that is not beautiful. So, you know, we are, uh, we're very blessed with this garden so far. And um, I'm gonna let the rest go a little bit longer, I think. There's no more huge ones, but, um, you know, I'll tell you what, man. These are, these are some really nice sized peppers. Not bad if I don't say so myself. That is a lot of peppers. And we got some nice size ones in there too. And we should just check that out. That is a great size pepper. And uh, you know, we didn't even harvest probably no more than a fifth of the peppers on here. We still got some that are gonna get a lot bigger. So I could have picked more, but I just figure why not, you know? I mean, let them get a little bigger and uh, it's only more to harvest later. So that's what we're gonna take for now is about a half a bushel. All right, and the next thing we're gonna harvest is some cucumbers here. We have some really nice sized cucumbers. These are uh, pretty much the biggest pickling cucumbers I've ever grown. And uh, we got some that are way bigger than this, but they get they tend to get a little seedy. Um, so I don't, really, I don't really prefer to let them go to their full size. Um, but you know, right here like this, they're all funny shaped, they're all weird because they were touching the ground and, and they would have been nice and straight had they been on the fence, but some of them formed down here on the ground and they kind of hit the ground and bent. So, you know, we take what we can get, but uh, <laughs> you know, there, there, is no, there is no perfection here. It's pretty much um, come as you are and uh, I'll take it because I'm really grateful for whatever I get. It doesn't matter about the shape, it's all gonna taste the same, right? So I'm going to uh, move on down here. I think that's about it for this plant. I, got, I only have about one plant per two square feet. I ended up coming through here and thinning because they were just so many, uh, so many plants that you, you, they were just a wall in here. So I came in and I trimmed some off at the bottom and pulled them out so that there could be more airflow because as you know, you know, you got the powdery mildew forming. Everyone already knows this. Uh, it's absolutely no new story for anyone here in Michigan. It just happens, you know, especially later in the season but it's been wet, it's been cold. And uh, here on the lake, we actually have um, kind of a, a very air conditioned, naturally air conditioned garden, because what happens is uh, during the day, the cold air pretty much heats up and pulls cool air off the water. It's just um, natural convection. Hot air rises and brings cool air in from the water. So we have really cold days, even though it can be inland, it can be 30, 40 degrees warmer. Um, here it's like no more than 75 degrees. So, you know, that's one of those things you just live and learn, but we still love it here and it still produces like crazy. Um, and so uh, it's just one of those things that, you know, it, it uh, it's good for some things, but um, as the years go on, we're progressively deciding what we're gonna grow here, what we're gonna grow at the house and what kind of grows better in uh, each each location just because um, you know cucumbers might be one of those things that we have to grow at the house because the cucumbers grow great at the house but it just seems like you know every year they only go about half a season before they're before they're looking like this so they've been looking like this for a while and uh, oh there's a little honeybee that just came in and started pollinating the flowers see and that's another reason why I grew all these things and why I might grow them again is just because uh, it seems like uh, you know these flowers they just attract the honeybees we got the honey uh, the honeybee hives um, Back behind the garden and it just brings them in and it's so great to see so I might grow I might grow squash varieties here I mean they don't produce as well, but they give the honeybees some food and that's That's all that matters to me. So pretty cool watching them. I love watching them go in each a flower and uh, it's really unique because each Bee has its own task and a lot of people think they just go around pollinating different flowers but it's so unique because each bee has its own little task. And this bee right here that I'm watching won't go to a different flower. They will pollinate only the cucumber flowers. They'll fly, 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 fly. And when they can't find another flower to pollinate, they go back to the hive. And then they basically get reassigned a new task. So my, they might go to clover. And then all they will do is pollinate clover. They won't go from a clover to a cucumber. And that's just so crazy how that works. And it's just, I guess nature's way of saying, you know, uh, I give you a pollinator, but this pollinator is not going to uh, cross-pollinate a bunch of different plants 
um, it's going to have just one task, and that's to pollinate this one plant and uh, ensure that this one plant survives. And then when this one plant is taken care of, I'll move on to another plant. And it's just so unique. I'm just watching this bee go in and out and in and out and in and out, and it's just, it's just so awesome to see. So let's move on and see if we can find some other cucumbers. I'll leave this little guy be, and he can, uh, <laughs> no pun intended, uh, and we can um, let him just pollinate some more flowers for us. Now the very last thing that I was going to address um, before I just do a little more, bit more harvesting uh, before I get the tomatoes is I was going to address the question of, Luke, do you ever experiment with plants? And uh, yes, I do. Now I don't experiment with like cross pollinations. I did that a while back and I realized it was just easier to uh, let, you know, let uh, nature do its course. If I get a crazy, crazy cross pollination, so be it. Um, but I'm not going to actively try to do that. Um, but I do experiment with growing different plants and different varieties. So for instance, this year was big for yellow zucchini. And let me tell you what, sometimes they don't pay off, but sometimes they do. And so one thing that I was going to say is that over the course of your, um, your garden's maturing period, you know, not necessarily maturing period in the course of a year, but over the course of several years, because a garden is an investment. You, you essentially build it and uh, then year after year you reap the rewards of that initial effort and it continuously gets better. But part of making it better is basically uh, assigning a certain part of the garden for experiments. I have a little bit of garden space designated to zucchini. I wanted to see which zucchini varieties produced the best and which ones didn't so that I could kind of cross out those varieties that didn't do well and basically grow the, the good varieties next year. And that's what I really stress because uh, there's a lot of people that just want to continuously test different varieties. And then they're always disappointed, oh, my garden didn't produce that well. Well, maybe it's the variety. You know, certain things don't produce well in your area. And so one way you can optimize success in your garden is by designating a little portion to a few plants to test and then keeping the rest of the garden designated to plants that you have found to be successful uh, in the past. So that's one thing that I've been doing with my yellow zucchini. And let me tell you what, I'm going to be growing yellow zucchini next year. Uh, it is it is blowing my mind. I'm telling you what, it is produced more, it is produced later. It does not get the powdery mildew. I mean, it has a little bit here and there, but it does not get what other plants have gotten. And uh, the squash vine borers haven't got to it. It's just been an all around amazing producer. So I'm definitely gonna be growing that. But next year, if I find a new variety that I think, hey, um, I'm interested in trying this, I'm not gonna plant a whole, you know, a whole bunch of it and completely forget about the yellow zucchini. I'll grow probably three quarters of my plants being yellow zucchini and then another, and then the other quarter being the experimental plants that I want to see if they produce better or equal to the yellow zucchini. So that's what I've been doing and uh, it's been paying off really, really well. I have some, <laughs> I have some more yellow zucchini. And, hold on, it's not done yet. This is from just one plant. And this is the end of the season, mind you, when people are not getting zucchini. I just got these two from the same plant. Uh, there's another one that's going to be ready soon, but I'll let that wait, you know. I like them pretty big like this. You get more bang for your buck. These are, whoopsie, these are really good eating size right here. These um, are just the best eating size. They're low on seeds, and uh, the seeds are small. These get a little seedier, but still not all that seedy. And so, you know, if you can get more food to feed your family just by waiting a couple extra days, because these things grow fast. I mean, the difference between this and this is probably about two days worth of rain. So, um, you know, it's it definitely pays to wait a little bit. So I'm gonna continue harvesting these and then we're gonna go over and get some tomatoes. Check out this little guy that was just hopping on one of my zucchini plants. He's just, <laughs> he's just so full of life. Little tree frog, I just love these things. And they really do, uh, they really do just eat the bugs up. I mean, telling you what, when you have 20, 30 of these things, they just, they just absolutely love to, uh, <laughs> they just absolutely love to eat. And it's small now, but I'm telling you what, after, after a few weeks, this thing will be getting it up in size. And I don't know what they do in the winter time, but pretty interesting creature nonetheless. See, this is the problem I'm having here. 
As you can see, there is no end in sight for the amount of tomatoes that I have. And even some back there. Sure, they don't have much color on the, the vines, but I, boy, do I have the tomatoes. And there are some huge ones. The problem that I'm having is that they're just not ripening. And so, I do have some here. I'm going to pick for you all. This is the Berkeley tie-dye. And uh, as you know, I am doing the the uh, Noah's Ark Tomatoes Pro or the Noah's Ark Tomato Project. And that's something that I started this year that I just really wanted to highlight all the different diversity. So I'm growing two plants of each variety. And so this plant right here is a beautiful plant. It's producing extremely, extremely well. I mean, I could probably count maybe 40, 50 tomatoes, all of this size. I, this plant's so big and so laden with tomatoes that it's actually falling over and um, I'll just let it fall over. There's no point in staking it up at this point just because it's nearing the end of the season. But I do come by here and I do grab the tomatoes that are blushing um, because it's one of those things we come up here on a weekly basis. So you have tomatoes like this that, you know, uh, they could go another three or four days, maybe even five or six, but I'm picking them now because they're starting to blush, they're starting to turn here, and uh, and they'll be ripe in no time. And um, same thing with, you know, this one that I just picked, because oftentimes if we let them go, these are the only ones we have ripening. I mean, not the only ones, but like these are, these tomatoes that are ripe are the only ones that are, that are ripe. And who knows, if we lose these, we might not have another harvest. So I just like to pick them, uh, you know, right now so we can at least ensure that we do have some tomatoes to enjoy, some tomatoes to put away, and some tomatoes to make some uh, delicious spaghetti sauce with. And this one right here is the Paul Robson. Beautiful, beautiful tomato. This is about two days from being perfect. So we got the Paul Robson. And here we have the Granny Cantrell's German Pink. This is, uh, a very large variety. Let's see if we can get this one here. With the stem intact. Great, 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 great. Good. There you go. The Granny Cantrell's German Pink. Beautiful, beautiful stripations on the undersides. It's just an absolutely beautiful tomato. I have another one here that's blushing, so I'll pick this one. But this one, again, as you can see, a little cracking. No biggie at all, though. These will be enjoyed in no time. Make a nice heirloom tomato salad. Maybe for a midweek snack episode. I don't know. And then we have here the Rosso Sicilian. This is just a beautiful, almost a pumpkin-shaped tomato. Just little, perfect little bumps. Nice flat tomato. Very, very beautiful. We got a couple more in here that are a little smaller, but still beautiful nonetheless. So this is the Rosso Sicilian. All right, don't mind the uh, weird angle. It's the only place I could get you in there. So this right here is an orange banana. And the reason why they call it orange banana, oops, that one was very ripe, perfect. The reason why they call it orange banana is because it is a perfectly orange Roma tomato. Looks nothing like a banana, but there you go. That is the orange banana. And then coming in through here, we have the ever so popular Polish linguisa. Just a beautiful, beautiful tomato in every sense of the word. I absolutely just love this tomato. Beautiful red, nice point. Not as large as a Jersey Devil, but very, very elegant and uh, awesome paste tomato. And then obviously you have the elephant in the room here. This is the Big Rainbow. This is a yellow tomato that when fully ripe has orange stripations. I'm having a hard time snapping off here. There we go, right, we got it. It's a very beautiful tomato. 
and uh, it's not fully ripe, but you're going to notice that uh, when it is ripe, that there will be orange stripes. When you cut it, those orange stripes will stay in there and uh, just goes throughout the entire tomato. Very, very beautiful. And a big size too. And this tomato right here is the Calypso. I'll tell you what, if you want a good producing, delicious tomato, you have got to try this variety. This Calypso, if I can get it off the vine here, is so beautiful and nearly a flawless, flawless shape. I mean, it is so perfect. And this is an heirloom tomato, and usually you don't see perfect shapes on an heirloom tomato. Usually they're all bumpy and cat-faced. This is a Calypso tomato, and it, uh, it's, just, it's just a very beautiful, very prolific producing plant here. I mean, I'm going to have probably 40, 50 plants. I will say the one thing is, oops, sorry, I bumped you there. The one thing I will say is that they don't come off the vine very easily. You pretty much have to take them off without the the top, which looks really nice if you can get the top, but these don't have that um, that bend in them that uh, allows you to do that. You pretty much have to take them off just like that, but that's just a little downside. Obviously that won't affect the flavor much, but see they don't have that knuckle. They don't have that knuckle that you can kind of pop and uh, let it go, so these ones have to come off like that, but still very well worth it. And this tomato right here is called Violet Jasper. It is a very beautiful, this is about as big as they get. It's a very beautiful tomato that has kind of shimmery uh, green stripes that will kind of turn to almost like a golden color when it's absolutely positively 100% ripe. And uh, the rest of it will be kind of a burgundy, kind of like a burgundy pink. And uh, it's just a very beautiful tomato. We have so many in here. This is a very, very epic, prolific plant. Uh, I'll tell you what, if you want a tomato that produces, this plant will do just that. I mean, they are in no no way stopping. Um, and it's just a, I mean, it's not doing so well. It's probably stopping producing, but if it was in healthy shape, it would still be producing, let's put it that way. And then this plant right here, is the yellow boar. And the reason why they call it yellow boar is because it's a fuzzy yellow tomato. Now if you come over here, you're gonna see this kind of off-white kind of fuzziness to it. And that's because the, the plant here, I'm not even sure if I can get it, it's so fine. But the, the tomato actually has, maybe in the light, the tomato actually has a fuzziness to it. Eh, you're not going to be able to see it, but you can trust me. It's almost like a peach fuzz on there. It's really cool. Very cool tomato. And this tomato right here is called Stupus, and if it was in good condition, um, you know, it would still be producing as well, but let me tell you what, you want a productive tomato you'd be stupid not to grow this. <laughs> this is a crazy producing tomato. Not big, but definitely makes up for it in production. I'm telling you what, we have picked probably 50, 60 tomatoes off this plant already, this one plant, and uh, it is just producing like crazy. It's got just tons of tomatoes and uh, tons more, tons more still coming on. Obviously the plant is dead all but the tops. That's about the same with every tomato, so hopefully we're gonna get a few more tomatoes out of here. But, um, but yeah, there is Stupus. All right, and this tomato is my favorite. It's gotta be my favorite. As you can see, that is not something wrong with the tomato. That is the coloration of this tomato. It's called a striped cavern. It is a yellow and red striped stuffing tomato. It's actually hollow on the inside. It's just almost like a pepper. And uh, I'll tell you what, productive as can be, just loaded with tomatoes. And uh, by no means stopping, this is just a great tomato. And uh, I would imagine it would make amazing paste too because what makes 
great tomato paste is not having that that high water content that that gushiness in the middle and these are awesome they're hollow they're beautiful and uh, I'll tell you what that is an awesome tomato I'm definitely gonna be saving seeds from that and this tomato right here is the homestead tomato if you want just an average sized tomato with a whole lot of classic tomato flavor this tomato is going to be for you absolutely stunning tomato I mean it is it's kind of what I think of as the classic uh, homemade ketchup tomato it is just what you'd expect to see on a ketchup bottle I mean it is beautiful it's perfect and it's so tasty and now it's time for the most productive tomato that I have and this is the black zebra this is similar to the uh, to the violet jasper although it's a cherry tomato it's very beautiful and I'll tell you what what you're seeing is not an optical illusion it is all tomatoes this thing is just solid tomatoes and uh, we've probably picked a good 50, 60 off this plant as well. So this plant is going crazy and it's actually still producing. So awesome to see. And this tomato right here is the black crim. Now this is a beautiful, decent sized beef steak. Very good in flavor. And uh, ends up ripening to be almost a, a full mahogany color here. This, one's, this one is perfect. This is exactly what they're supposed to look like. Just a beautiful mahogany color with a little green shoulders and it is a absolutely stunning, stunning tomato. And this beautiful tomato right here is called Omar's Lebanese. And I'll tell you what, this is a gorgeous, gorgeous tomato that easily rivals uh, pink brandy wine. You know, pink brandy wine is kind of one of those pink tomatoes that everybody sees as being just that beautiful pink tomato. But I'll tell you what, for size and for just the sheer beauty of it, this definitely rivals pink brandywine. And now I don't know what it's gonna look like when we cut it open, but this is Omar's Lebanese. So it's definitely up there in uh, beauty. Then you have your Mar Globe. This is your classic, kind of your classic uh, tomato sauce tomato. It's Pretty productive. I mean, it's not as productive as some, but you got some, you got some decent production with decent size. So that's that's a winner in my opinion. And then you have this tomato, which seems unique until you see it fully ripen. And there you have the winner. This right here is the hands down winner for most beautiful tomato. It is called Indigo Rose. It is actually new. It is a new variety out uh, for 2013, or I think it's 2013. They just released these, and they are a stunning, stunning tomato. So I am definitely proud to have said that I've grown this new variety. Definitely will be growing it again for its beauty. It is a winner. I don't know how it tastes, but we'll find that out when we get home. And there you go. That's what I got so far uh, from the Noah's Ark Tomato Project. I'm gonna go home and uh, we're gonna film some other stuff because news flash for anyone not aware of this yet, uh, school is starting back up. So I wanted everyone to know that the schedule will be stricter now. I was uploading kind of sporadically whenever I could find something to bring you all along for. I wanted to obviously put up as much content as I could so that you all could have something to watch when I'm not uploading as much. So by doing that, I have a lot of videos a lot of people probably have not seen yet. So they're up. Go check them out, uh, but I'm going to be uploading more frequently. Cindy's going to be doing the Wednesday midweek snack, and then I'm going to have Monday and Friday for an upload. So be patient. It's going to be a little more uh, infrequent, um, so it's not as it's not as uh, it's not as often. Let's put it that way. But I will make the length a little bit longer, so that you all have a little more sustenance. And uh, I hope you all enjoyed this nice long episode. And until that next episode comes around, this is Luke from My Gardener, hoping you're growing big or going home. I'll catch you all later. See ya. Bye.